we come into your presence and we bow in humility, in love, in worship before you. We have come to meet with you. We've come to see you in your glory. We've come to hear what you have to say. Open your word to us, Lord, and open our hearts to be receptive. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we pray, change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, make it more like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Make me and mold me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God. Father, you say I will make a new covenant with my people. I will be your God and you shall be my Amen. The reading set for today um, are Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 to 10, and the Gospel is from St. John chapter 12, verses 20 to 30. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 12, reading from verses 20 to 33. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified and exalted. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain and yields a harvest. The one who loves his life loses it. But the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and wherever I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled and deeply distressed. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it is for this purpose that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd of people who stood nearby and heard the voice said that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if and when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. God of suffering and glory, in Jesus Christ you reveal the way of life. Inscribe your law on our hearts, that we may not stray from you. 
but remain your faithful people through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father, we pray as John prepares to preach, gracious God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with thankfulness what you say to us today. to be looking at John chapter 12, um, the passage that we just read from the Gospel. Don't you really love those words of those Greek men when they came to Philip and they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. What a profound statement. I love it. And it becomes my prayer as I enter church each week. Jesus then goes on to expand and expound about the hour that has come. And it's the hour for him to be glorified. He says he has to fall into the ground and die, and his servants have to follow him. Uh, do you see the disciples looking at each other? And in their stare are the words, um, I don't think I signed up for that. But Jesus says, Lord, what should I really say? Should I say, Father, save me? <laughs> what would you say? You know you're going to have crown of thorns on your head, going to be whipped 40 times, going to be nailed to a cross, and going to have a, pierce, a spear stuck in you. What would you say? Yeah, I'd certainly say, Father, save me. That's the first thing that I'd say. But Jesus says, no, it was for this reason I came to this hour. Rather, I say, Father, glorify thy name. And then the voice of God comes down and acknowledges Jesus. So, what does Jesus say? He says, now is the crisis or the judgment of this world. Now is the crisis of this world. The decision has been made. The illness of the world has reached a crisis point. It's a case of kill or cure. Or in Jesus' case, it is kill and cure. His death was the turning point, the hinge of the world's history. Now the death of Christ meant the death of the power of sin over us. When he died, Satan received his death stroke. Now there's hope for the world. The cross crisis has passed. Now the darkness of our lives can be transformed by the light of the world. Why? Because the cross has become the central attraction the cross has become the great magnet drawing men and women to himself. It's all about Jesus. All about Jesus. He says, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. This he said signifying what death he should die. From his word, it's apparent that his power to draw people to himself lies in his death. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of attraction and power in his life and teaching. But the main attraction lies in his death upon the cross. I suppose we would probably make it his miracles or his amazing statements about God. God makes it the nails in his hands as the centre point. Spurgeon in one of his sermons says that for a man's work to prosper, it is not desirable that he should die. 
Yet Jesus breaks all the rules and by his death possesses his most powerful influence over us. Always remember that this is in spite of dying a shameful death. The death of the cross was not imposed on Roman citizens. It was kept for slaves and the worst type of criminal. We too must see the cross in all of its awfulness. Not the varnished or the shiny one we see in our church. We must understand all the ignominy and the shame associated with the cross before we can begin to understand how Jesus and his disciples hated the very idea of the cross. The disciples dismissed any idea of such a death and Jesus prayed with fear that if possible his father would not allow such a death. Even though he goes through such an atrocious death, he loses none of his power to attract people to him. And it actually works to attract more and more people to him. The crucified Christ has irresistible power to draw people to himself. When they realise that he loved them and gave himself for them, Summarised in the Bible words, here in his love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave himself for us. When he was stretched on the cross, the earth erupted and broke apart. The sky went black at midday. The holiest place in this temple had its veil torn from top to bottom. And most spectacularly of all, a thief turned to him in faith and a hardened Roman centurion acknowledged that he was the Son of God. Now while here on earth he drew a few to himself. Okay, I understate the fact he had thousands come to him but they didn't all follow him. But on the cross he drew all to himself. What was it that drew all people to himself? Let us realise that he does not attract to a church. He doesn't attract to a sect, a memory of great power or an achievement, nor to a cathedral or a tabernacle, not to a victorious party or a particular racial group. They were drawn to himself. And nobody could draw them but himself. Paul said that he determined to preach nothing amongst the Corinthians but Jesus Christ and him crucified. It is expressed in the best known verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. The cross gives a brighter and a more brilliant display of God's love than anything else we will ever see. Now I'm going to make a bold statement. All people who hear the truth about Jesus are drawn to him, but they all do not submit to him. Now notice I said they're drawn to him. They're not drawn to the church or to a particular way of thinking. They are drawn to him. Because when they see him, there is a tugging at their heart. Some pull back and the worst is even when they pull back so much that Jesus lets go. Then they fall backward into a destruction that they have chosen for themselves, having resisted the Saviour and refused eternal life. How sad is the situation when a person find, fights against their own salvation. They hear the tug of the preacher words. They feel the tug of their own conscience. 
These are felt time and time again as Jesus draws them to himself, time without number. Now not all come in spite of the drawing of Jesus. Christ crucified the power of God and the love of God striving to draw, draw us to himself. There is no exclusion of any class, culture, degree of knowledge or literacy. They all meet and share common ground at the cross. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to myself. Hearing about Jesus is so amazing. He is always fresh and attractive. I've been going to church for over 60 years. What is it that brings me back every week? I want to hear about Jesus, see his work and worship him. Let me ask you, what other topic would bring you back every week for 60 years? Would Greek philosophy? The theory of evolution? They may be good for two or even three lectures, but never for every week for 60 years. Only Jesus could do that. It is the power of his love. He laid aside his honour and glory, forsook his position in heaven, put aside his creative powers and took human form to come to earth to die so that he could draw you and me to himself. This love transforms enemies to friends, despisers of God to lovers of Jesus. He came to us and the only crime he was found guilty of was an excess of love. When we are drawn to Jesus, he bestows upon us rest and peace. We all have doubts and we all have fears. We ask ourselves, could it be true? Is God with me? Am I truly forgiven? Then we gaze at Christ, lifted up on the cross. We see the thorns on his head and the nails in his hands, the pain on his face and the love in his eyes. And I personally know that Jesus did this for me. He bore my sin. He cleared my conscience, gave me his peace and changed my life beyond recognition. Now the Holy Spirit may draw you gradually, little by little, or he may grab you by the collar suddenly. He may draw us gently or powerfully, in secret or in quietness, in noise or in torment. But he does draw us. You may be a long way off, or you may be feel, feel lost or deserted, in despair or in your right mind. But Jesus pulls that little thread connecting us to him and draws us to himself. Because we're in sin, we resist him. If we were in our right mind, we would rush to him as fast as we could. Today I set before you life and death. Please choose life. Let Jesus draw you to himself. Whatever your state, and no matter how far you are away, come, view him lifted up, and surrender your life to him. Let's pray. Lord, we have all felt the tug of your love, the tug of your amazing grace, the tug of your unending offer of salvation. We want to come to you and renew our commitment to you. As you're lifted up in the midst of us, Lord, we look to you and we want to know afresh the saving power that brought us to you in the first place. We want to know the love which passes understanding. 
We want to experience the peace which only comes from forgiveness and salvation. Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Christ, the source of our eternal salvation, who was designated by God as a high priest, may we drink from his priesthood. May we, as Christ submits himself to God, submit ourselves to his priestly guidance. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love and pray for this day and forever.